How many of you like to either play sports or to watch sports, either live or on TV? Put your hands up there if that's you. Okay. So at least half of us, and then the rest of you would say, well, if it's my son or my grandson or my granddaughter, then I would certainly watch that. Um, it's interesting that human beings are a sports-minded people, and they have been from the beginning. And there's several references to athletics in Scripture and that God uses athletics to illustrate a lot of things in the Christian life. And I'm just going to give you a couple examples as we begin. Uh, two main ones would be running, as in running a race, and fighting, as in boxing primarily. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 9.24, Paul writes, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Uh, whenever we see running in a race uh, in Scripture, the, the issue is ambition and, and a commitment to do your absolute best. In Hebrews 12, 1, it says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. It's the idea that the Christian life is a, it's not just a sprint. It's not something you do good for a week and say, well, now I can lay back and, and, and just relax and do what I want to do. But it's a, it's a marathon. It, it takes endurance. It takes patience. Uh, the scriptures talk about fighting and, and um, things that we can learn about the Christian life through fighting and primarily boxing. 2 Timothy 4.7, Paul writes, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. Uh, he's saying it's the feeling that a boxer has when the fight is over and he knows he's done his best. And he can say, hey, I feel good. I, I fought a good fight. Or one who is running a race and he says, I, I completed the course. I finished it. Um, hallelujah. Sometimes when you run a race, you don't finish. There might be an injury. There might be uh, just a case of getting weary and, and quitting. In 1 Corinthians 9, 26, Paul writes, Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. In other words, I'm not just out for a morning jog where I could go here or I could go here or I could just quit. He's saying the, the life as a believer is like a race and there's a definite goal and a definite purpose in mind. He goes on to say in the same verse, I box in such a way as not beating the air. He said, I, I'm not, when I think of boxing, he says, I, I'm in a fight to, uh, to win. I'm not just punching at shadows or make-believe things. There's something real going on. And there's a sport that I sometimes wish was referenced in Scripture. It's not because it didn't exist at the time. Um, but there's a lot of lessons in the game of golf that make wonderful life lessons in the Christian life. And uh, there was a local golf tournament, and on a sunny Saturday morning, just perfect for golf, a man was beginning his pre-swing routine, and he was visualizing the coming shot when this voice comes over the clubhouse loudspeaker, would the gentleman on the ladies' tee back up to the men's tee, please? Well, the man was still deep in his routine, and he, it seemed like he was totally mindless of this interruption. And again, the announcement, would the man on the woman's tee kindly back up to the men's tee? Well, that was too much for the man. He broke his stance, and he lowered his club to the ground, and he raised his voice. Would the announcer in the clubhouse kindly be quiet and let me play my second shot? Uh, If you've ever golfed, uh, maybe you would agree with me and say, well, sometimes I've played my second shot from even a worse place than the ladies' tee. Uh, one of the frustrations of golf that really ties in with biblical principle is this. Um, it's the problem of past defeat, the rule in golf that you play it as it lies. Wherever you hit your last shot, that's where your next shot takes place from. Um, I saw some golf on TV yesterday, 
And one of the players, he's an older one, he's uh, pushing 50 years old, and he hit a tee shot that was about eight inches from a wooden wall. And if you go off the wooden wall, you fell into a lake. And he was right-handed, and that was the wrong hand to be to make that shot. And he, he stood there. It was Jim Furyk, and he stood there, and he could have half of his shoes on the wooden wall and half of his feet hanging over the lake. And he tried to do practice swings several times, and, he, and, uh, and, and the announcers were saying he's afraid to hit it because he knows if he takes a swing, he's going to fall backwards into this lake. And uh, it was really interesting. I got Jan's attention, and she's not really into watching golf, but she couldn't take her eyes off of that. And uh, he took several partial swings, and I could tell he was scared to death. What am I going to do here? And then finally, he just tapped it out into the middle, and he just said, I'll, I'll just take the penalty. But the principle of play it as it lies, that's life. The opportunities that you have today are based on what you did with your life yesterday. And if you did the wrong thing in your life yesterday or a year ago, it affects what you face today in life. And that's, that's the, the key lesson in our, in our passage of Scripture today. It's the problem of past failures. You remember from last week, Israel... Um, Chapter 6, verse 10 in Judges, God speaks to Israel. He says, but you have not obeyed me. Chapter 6, verse 6 says, Israel was brought very low because of Midian. Uh, great oppression, great affliction, great misery upon the people of Israel. And it was because of the problem of past failures. They had disobeyed and they had aroused the wrath of God. God's judgment was upon them. And basically, as they looked at life, life looked hopeless, life looked miserable, and it was all related to what they had done in their yesterdays. None of us are strangers to failure, but some bad moves are much worse than others. Some failures entail such horrible consequences and such a total collapse of morale uh, that we just can't bounce back. And the outlook for the future seems hopeless because of how terribly we've messed up in the past. Uh, would you turn with me to Judges chapter 6, and we'll read verses 11 to 14. And would you please stand with me as I read. Judges 6, beginning in verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiah's right, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress in order to save it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And then Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? Lord God, I pray that you would direct our minds, direct our hearts today. What it means to be a deliverer. Help us to see the sense in which you've called us to be a deliverer. And I pray that especially that each of us, our eyes would be open to realize that the great deliverer is not Gideon, uh, but it's the Lord Jesus. And we thank you that he is the wonderful, merciful Savior that we so desperately needed. Help us to see him today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, we start out here with a, a question uh, it's, it's the question of unexpected troubles. In verse 13, uh, this angel of the Lord who uh, obviously looked like a human being, we're going to find out later it was the Lord himself. It was an Old Testament appearance of the second person of the Trinity. 
And uh, this one appeared unto Gideon as he was working. And uh, he says, hey, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And, and Gideon's response is, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? It was the question of unexpected troubles. If the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? If God is really with us, why does life stink so bad? Why are there so many problems? Why is there so much misery? Why, why does my body feel like it does? Why is our health so bad? Why are our finances broken? Why is our nation in trouble? Uh, all these things, if the Lord is with us, it, it boils down to this. To our way of thinking, the presence of God strongly suggests the absence of troubles. That was Gideon. And when this one comes and says, hey, the Lord is with you, he said, really? I, I'm not seeing it. I'm not buying it. Uh, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Why do we have so much trouble if the Lord is with us? Uh, you remember what they were facing, that uh, in a culture, in an economy, where essentially it's twofold, it was raising livestock, and growing crops, agriculture, and the, the Midians would come, and when their crops were just about ready to be harvested, the Midianites would come swarming in, and they'd either destroy all the crops, or they would take it all for themselves, and they would kill the animals that belonged to Israel, and the Israelites, this, this goes on for, I think it said seven years, Israel was brought very low, their dying, they're starving, their, their morale is shot. And now the Lord comes to Gideon and he says, hey, the Lord is with you. And Gideon is, really? Come on. He can't be with us. If the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Um, first of all, to our way of thinking, the presence of God strongly suggests the absence of troubles. Additionally, we think that the presence of troubles indicates the absence of God. If my life is full of troubles, that means God abandoned me. God doesn't care. God doesn't see. He's not with me anymore. God, what happened to you? You failed. You, you, you abandoned me. You let me down. And if I have all these troubles, God let me down. And if... If God was really with me, if God was really for me, my life would be trouble-free. It would be easy. It would be sweet. It would be peaceful. That's Gideon's thinking. And, and Gideon is not alone. There's something in all of us that thinks that way. Uh, would you turn to Psalm 22? Psalm 22 is uh, initially, it's first of all, it's a psalm of David. It's David telling his own story. And I'd like to read some of this uh, for you. It's, uh, I'm going to start in verse 1. And this is David crying out to God based on his experience in life that he's dealing with. Chapter 22, beginning verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. So you get the idea. David saying, God, you abandoned me. You left me. Why? And why does he think that? Well, because he hasn't been delivered. He's got problems. He's groaning. Verse 2, oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy, O oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. And you are fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. Yeah, I know years ago you did some great things for Israel. Uh, you know, we heard all the stories about how the Israelites crossed the, the Red Sea. And, and all the Egyptians who chased them, they all drowned. And, and how you sent the plagues upon Egypt. And um, They trusted you, our fathers did, and, and you delivered them. Verse 5, to you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. He's saying, man, 
I've been so beaten down, I feel like I'm less than a human. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. All these people who know that I trust in you and I seek you, they make a mockery of me, a mockery of me. Verse 9, yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Verse 19, but you, O Lord, be not far off. O oh, you, my help, hasten to my assistance. David is crying out and he says, Lord, you've abandoned me. And I know because I have all kinds of troubles and, and nobody's rescuing me. And I cry out to you night and day, but you don't respond. And, and God, all that I can conclude is that you're absent. You left me. You abandoned me. And, and he's really struggling with this. And, and it illustrates what Gideon is saying, and I'm telling you, it's not just Gideon, it's not just David, it's all of us. When we have troubles, and none of us have trouble-free lives, by faith we cry out to God, and our thought is, Lord, if I cry out to you, you're the deliverer, you're the rescuer, you fix things. And sometimes we don't really see any change. And, uh, and we're like Gideon, we're like David, because the presence of God suggests troubles are gone. And when troubles are all around, we can only assume, God, you abandoned me. Uh, we can go further in Psalms and realize that God reassures David that he's near. He, still, he hasn't abandoned him. What is awesome to realize is that Psalm 22 is uh, it's what's called a messianic psalm. In other words, um, it's written by David to speak of his own life experiences, but it goes way beyond David's experience to speak of Christ's experience. For instance, you remember what Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in reality, what David comes to see is that God never forsook him, but the one who is greater than David really was forsaken by God. What David only thought he endured and what you and I only think we endure, Jesus actually did for us. And uh, he actually was forsaken of God because uh, he became sin for us. He, he identified himself with our sin and he offered himself up as a sin offering. And God in his wrath and holiness and justice abandoned him. He forsook him. We go back again then to, to Judges chapter 6. And, and so again to begin with, there's this question of unexpected trouble. Gideon is really distraught. He's, he, he's a God-fearing man. But when this one comes and announces to him that the Lord is with us, because uh, he says, well, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? There's a critical thing to see also before we go further. Uh, note the change in verse 13 from singular to plural. Uh, verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Uh, the you there is singular. Um, we use you and you could be, I, I could be speaking just to Brady, but I could say, hey, it's great to see you, and I could be speaking to everybody here. English is a little confusing, um, but if we looked in the Hebrew, we'd see, well, it is, it is a singular pronoun that's used. The Lord is with you, Gideon specifically. Singularly, Gideon, the Lord is with you. But Gideon doesn't pick up on that. Gideon changes it to the plural. And he says, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this horrible stuff happened to us? There's a real important message to latch on to here, and, and, and don't miss it. The Lord is with the deliverer, 
before he is with the people themselves. It starts with one. God says, I am with you, Gideon, in a special way, in a unique way. I am with you, and as we go through here, we're going to see ways that God is with him. Gideon wants to change it to, well, if you're with me, that must mean you're with all of us. And it's like, no, not yet. The people have begun to cry out to God as a body, as a people, um, but they're not totally restored to God yet. Uh, there's a process, and God is saying, Gideon, I'm with you. Gideon says, oh, great, you're with us. Well, then why are we in such a mess? And God says, I'm not with them in the same way that I'm with you just yet. Critical. It starts with one. Gideon is the one that God approaches and says, I'm going to use you. I want you to be a deliverer. It's going to start with you. I'm with you. You are the deliverer. They are the ones who need to be delivered. So we're going to move on a little bit. Uh, a second question then. We start with the question of unexpected troubles, but there's another question, the question of God's silence. Verse 13, Gideon says that, and where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? So the initial question is, well, if the Lord is with us, how come life stinks so bad? How come we don't have anything to eat? And how come we have no wealth? And, and everything that we've lost our homes, we've, we're hiding out in, in caves and behind rocks. And that's where, that's where our, our children, we have to put them in bed and, and lay them on a rock. And, and we're hiding for our lives. That's no way to live. And Gideon is saying, if the Lord's with us, why is our life so broken? Well, the second question comes, and where are all his miracles that our fathers told us about? It's nice that God delivered Israel way back when, but how about something today? You know, have you seen a miracle lately is the idea. Uh, he's saying, it's great that God blessed our forefathers, but he isn't doing much for us lately. I mean, we've been suffering and we've been crying out to God and, and, and we're, we're at our wit's end. And God won't say anything. He won't speak. How can you say God is with us when, first of all, we're in such a mess, all this has happened to us, and secondly, we know that God is a miracle-working God because our forefathers have given us the history of our people. But how can God be with us if he's able to work miracles, but he doesn't work miracles for us? Do you see the logic? It makes good sense. Gideon is a man of faith, but he, his faith is, is broken and it's struggling. When you and I experience trouble, we expect to see the power and the provision of God. We know God is powerful. He has all power. Uh, we know he has all wealth. All that is in the heaven and the earth is his, and he has all wisdom. So in our mind, what's trouble to God? He can fix anything. And so the question is, when we experience trouble, God I'm the one who gets in trouble when you're the fixer, right? Well, there's a couple issues. Number one, God doesn't always work on our timetable. Israel is struggling. They're confused. Their morale is low. Their faith is weak. It's, you know, Lord, what in the world's going on? We've sinned against you for at least seven years, but we've been repenting for maybe seven days, maybe seven weeks already. Uh, how long do we have to repent before you're going to make the bad stuff go away? Um, God doesn't always work on our timetable. Uh, Gideon referred to how God powerfully delivered Israel from Egypt, but what he forgot to mention is before deliverance from captivity, Israel was enslaved and held captive for how long? 400 years. It's like, whoa, it's one thing to remember the deliverance. It's another thing to remember God's timing. His timing is not necessarily our timing. And our timing is, is usually, you know, okay, God, I've been in trouble for three hours now. Uh, where are you? And God says, you learn best in trouble. 
And if I fixed everything right now, you won't learn anything. I'm more committed to your maturing than I am to your comfort, is the idea. And he doesn't necessarily work on our timetable. There's another truth that's here is sometimes God's silence is due to our sin. We're in trouble, and he's like, God, where are you? What's going on? And uh, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, a couple of interesting verses. It reads like this. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save. Neither is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Isaiah's telling Israel, and it was at a time where Israel was saying, God, where are you? Life is really broken right now, and we've called to you, and you don't seem to be responding. And Isaiah the prophet says, you know, sometimes God's silence is due to our sin, and that's what's going on here. He says, um, God could save you. His, his hand, his arm isn't short. His hand isn't weak. He could, he could save you. His ear isn't dull. He's not getting old and he doesn't hear so good. His ear could hear you, but he refuses to hear because your sin has created a separation between you and God. And he's not willing to, to hear until you're ready to turn from your sin and you're ready to cry out to him. You remember in this case here in Judges 6, uh, that God never comes to Gideon to raise him up as a deliverer until the people were so miserable in verse 6 that it says Israel was brought very low because of Midian and the sons of Israel cried to the Lord. When they cried to the Lord, God begins to raise up a deliverer. Not until... So we get to a third question, and this is the question that really answers all the questions. Verse 14, Gideon is, is crying out in verse 13, hey, oh my Lord, if the Lord is really with us, then why has all this happened to us? Where's all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us, and he's given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? Gideon is beginning to see something that he's not quite ready to see. God isn't lumping him in with all the people God is separating him out from the people, and God is calling on him to be the deliverer. It was Gideon singular, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And now God says to him, singular, go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have not I sent you singular? It's Gideon, you would like to be just lumped in with one of the people and, and we're all struggling and why doesn't God deliver us all? And he's saying, Gideon, you need to realize that's not the way I work. I work through people, I raise up a man and I enlist him as a deliverer and I send him and I enable him. And he goes and he preaches to the people. And he becomes the, the deliverer. Uh, you remember when God wanted to rescue Israel from Egypt. He didn't send a lightning bolt. He didn't send an angel to announce, hey, you know, my name's uh, Jimmy. And God sent me from heaven to deliver everybody. And so, hey, tomorrow we're cutting out of Egypt and we're going to Canaan. Uh, Instead, God went to Moses, and he says, Moses, I've heard the cry of my people, and I've seen their affliction, and I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go, and I want you to tell Israel that God has raised you up to be their leader. And Moses said, oh, hallelujah, great. No, he didn't say that. 
And he said, not me. I don't even talk good. God, I stutter. I'm the last one that you want to do this. You remember what God said? Oh, man, I didn't realize you stutter. I'll go get somebody else. He, he said, Moses, I'll be with your mouth, and I'll teach you what to say. In other words, you're right, Moses. You're not worthy. You're not capable. There's nothing great in you. I didn't pick you because you're the best speaker in Israel. I picked you because I picked you. In fact, I picked you because you can't do it. And I will be in you. God uses people to bring deliverance, and God himself is the great enabler. God's saying, you're going to be successful in this not because you're a good speaker or a great leader of people. You're going to be successful because I sent you. And I'm going to empower you, and I'm going to be with your mouth, and I'm going to be with you day in and day out. It's important that we see here that we begin to make this personal. Gideon isn't the only person that God ever raised up to be a deliverer. He raises up Gideon. We know he raised up Moses. He, he, he raised up Isaiah and he raised up Jeremiah and uh, he raised up David. And we could read through the Old Testament and see all kinds of people he raised up. And, and then in the New Testament, we, we see how he, he raised up his disciples and he raised up the Apostle Paul, and in one after the other, he, he, he met with them one-on-one. -on -one. And the reality is, if you're here as a believer today, God wants to use you as a deliverer in a similar way to what he latches on to Gideon. And it's as though God puts his finger in your chest and in my chest and he says those words of verse 12, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And our thoughts would be the same as Gideon's. Say, what? Valiant warrior? Are you kidding? In fact, where we see Gideon, he's anything but a valiant warrior. Uh, he's threshing wheat in the wine press. Uh, normally, um, threshing wheat would be done out in a, in a wide open area. But he doesn't want to do it in a wide open area because he'll be seen by the Midianites and they'll take everything he has. So he's, he's hiding away in a closed in area and the indication is, number one, there's fear of discovery by the Midianites, so he has to hide this. And secondly, his harvest is going to be very small. It may be enough to provide a little bit of food, but this isn't any big deal, big operation. And so when God says, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior, don't picture Gideon as six foot eight with massive chest and he's defying Midian and he's out threshing wheat and they can't stop him. He's little Gideon. And he's hiding what he's doing and he's barely coming enough food to keep his family alive. And one of the things you can get into with your groups this afternoon is, so what does it mean when God says, the Lord is with you? O valiant warrior. Uh, just as we bring this to a conclusion this morning, I say that God wants to use you and he wants to use me to bring deliverance. Well, the obvious question, well, what kind of attacks do our people encounter? What do they need to be delivered from? And our people are basically the people all around us. They're the people in Byesville, in Cambridge, in Guernsey County, in Ohio, and, and literally under the ends of the earth. And what are some attacks that they suffer from? What do they need to be delivered from? Uh, well, I might think of a few, and maybe they're not even the same ones you would come up with. But I, I thought of a few. Drug and alcohol addiction would be huge. Man, our people everywhere suffer from that. They need help. Uh, financial bondage. People are, uh, don't know how to handle their finances and get in all kinds of trouble and and, uh, and their feeling is, man, if I had $50, you know, it would change my life. But their bigger problem is not that they lack $50, it's that they lack the self-control and the wisdom to know what to do with $50 if they had it. I think of the problem of depression. And uh, whether it's older folks or young people or teenagers or even children, 
who are depressed in fourth grade and fifth grade and can't deal with the stresses of school and peer pressure and, and, and everything else. And it's like, I'm depressed. I can't deal with life. And, and they need a deliverer. Uh, abuse situations, sexual abuse and physical abuse. Uh, people need a deliverer. All those are real, but primarily our people in our world need deliverance from sin. If you think about what's the worst affliction anyone could have, the worst possible affliction you could have is sin. And why do I say that? Well, number one, it leads to death 100% of the time. It's worse than cancer in that sense. It's deadly 100% of the time. And not only is it the worst possible affliction in that sense, that it's always deadly, but it begins immediately. Every one of us, even though we're not dead, we're, we're all dying. And, uh, you know, if you've got aches in your knees or, or somewhere, you know, if, if your hair is just turning the wrong color or it's falling out, it's because you're dying. Death is working in us. This is affliction that we all understand, unfortunately. It's the worst possible affliction because it's always deadly. But it's even worse than that because it not only leads to physical death, but it entails spiritual death. All the other afflictions we know lose their hold over us when we die. If your affliction is that a parent abuses you, they can only abuse you till you're dead and then their power over you ends. If it's financial trouble, if it's a, a rough marriage, whatever it is, it can only harass us until we're dead and then we're set free. This affliction is so bad that not only does it drive us to the grave, but then for eternity, sin judges us and ruins us and destroys us in hell. It is the worst possible affliction. But not only that, the highest number of people are afflicted by it. If I was talking about that with cancer, you might say, well, thankfully, not all that many people have it. You know, maybe, um, you know, fortunately, it's not that common. Uh, sin is the worst possible affliction, number one, because it's always deadly and it, the consequences go even beyond the grave. But the most possible, God says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There, there's none of us that can say, well, I know some of you guys are messed up, but thank the Lord, uh, sin never got me. It's like, no, every single one of us has the disease. That is deadly 100% of the time, and it chases us beyond the grave and through eternity. And what we desperately needed is a deliverer. A savior, same concept. And I'd like to just point out to you that there is one who is greater than Gideon. We might say that Jesus is the greater Gideon. Gideon was raised up to be a deliverer. And all he could say is, well, and we're going to see this next week, uh, I'm not really worthy. And, and he was a very reluctant deliverer. It's like, you know, there's got to be somebody else who can do this. Not me. I'm, I'm not the right one. When the Bible introduces us to Jesus, he's not reluctant. Uh, we read in Hebrews that uh, he said, I, I, I've, a body you have prepared for me that I might come and I could do your will, O God. I've, I've come to give my life. I've come to suffer. I've come to die. I've come to be the deliverer, the savior. He's the wonderful, merciful Savior that we desperately needed. But there's a second application to all of this, and that is for all of you who, who are here as believers, who, who are saved people. I mentioned God wants you as a deliverer. You say, well, how do you know that? I've never had an angel come to me when I was at work and say, hey, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Um, I've never had that. And, and I would say, well, Yes, you have, really. In 1 Corinthians 5, verses 18 to 20. 
It says, now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, all the believers it's talking about, the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Paul writes and he said, all we who are believers, God raised up as deliverers. It's as though he came to us and he said, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And we said, me? I'm no valiant warrior. And he said, I'm committing to you the ministry of reconciliation. I'm enlisting you as an ambassador for me that you would go and proclaim that Jesus is the deliverer and that in him there is freedom from sin and its awful penalty. There is life, there's escape, there's freedom in Christ. James 5, 19 and 20. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. If you looked at the context here, I believe it's talking about people who are part of a local church assembly but are not true believers. And I don't have the time to trace that through. But it's, it's the idea, it's somebody who travels in the church and among the believers but is not a true believer. And it's saying, for you who, who are the true believers, the true saints of God, as you look around and you see a sinner in your midst, you can, you can turn that one from the error of his way and save his soul from death, and you can cover a multitude of sins by introducing to him to the one, her to the one, that is the deliverer. We can't save, but God gave us the ministry of being the one who introduces people to the great deliverer, the Lord Jesus. And when we would respond like Gideon and say, whoa, I can't do that. And, uh, you know, there's got to be somebody better than you. His response is, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. You're right, you can't do it, but he can in you. And through you. Would you close your eyes, bow your heads? I'd like to say, first of all, if, if you're somebody who's here and you've never called on the Lord Jesus as the wonderful, merciful Savior and said, God, I need you to deliver me from the wretchedness of sin, it's destroyed my life. And apart from you, I have no hope. God, would you set me free? Change my heart, change my life, deliver me. Forgive me. Because Jesus died in my place. God will receive you. And if you're here today as one who's never called upon Christ, there's nothing bigger in your life than that. Would you pray for folks who might be here without Christ? God, work in our midst today, powerfully change hearts. Beyond that, if you're here as a believer, I know the vast majority of you have professed faith in Christ. God has raised you up. He's given you the ministry of reconciliation. He calls you his ambassador. And our instinct is there's got to be somebody better than me. And the issue is he didn't call you because you were so talented or so outgoing or you had the gift of gab. He called you because he said, I have sent you and I will enable you. And I want to use you to bring deliverance to needy people. And I would ask you now if you would just humbly Say yes to him. God, use me. I don't feel worthy, but God, use me. Let your will be done in me. Guide me, direct me, even this week.
allow me to bring deliverance in Jesus' name to broken people. Lord God, we pray that you would use us, strengthen our faith, help us to see you, help us to see Jesus through the wonderful, merciful Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.